okay, our dean is gone, so I can contradict him now, saying that also science talks are important for this conference. <laughs> so I think it's a crucial element that we learn what each other in different communities are doing. And I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker of the morning session, Bianca Dietrich. So she is, has been faculty at Perimeter for 10 years now, a little bit more. And her background is in loop quantum gravity, spin forms, and recently also in Lorentzian computations. And she has also been the key organizer of the predecessor of this conference. So if you were around for quantum gravity 2020, this is the person who made it happen. So when we looked for a speaker that can actually summarize the key challenges of the field, I was very happy that she immediately said, yes, I can do this. So and now I'm very curious of what you will be able to tell us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Frank. Let me first thank uh, the organizers of this nice conference. That's Frank, uh, who did a lot of work. <laughs> I understand. Uh, Renate, Beatrice, uh, Antonio, Timothy, and Padri. Um, and I know how much work it is. <laughs> and it's even in person. So um, it's great to meet here. Um, so the organizers asked me to, to talk about uh, common challenges. And well, I will talk about some um, of these uh, challenges. As it is in quantum gravity, you know, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So that's part of, of the issues. But uh, let us try to cover what we might not know. So um, quantum gravity is a very vast field. And since I will come to that, we have not so many um, experimental uh, clues yet. And there's really a nice diversity of ideas. And well, I've taken this picture from the ISQG web page. I might try to identify your approach in this picture. So, the so since we have this uh, diversity of ideas, which start uh, from you know, different starting points, it's really important to learn from each other and to look for shared challenges um, and principles. And so, of course, I will present only a biased selection of these uh, challenges. And you might find more um, in the SNOMAS paper we wrote um, last year. And the first one, the first challenge is that well, our universe is, is Lorentzian, at least uh, most of the times. But why is that a, a challenge? So it's a challenge because well, a big part of the work which has been done in quantum gravity has been actually done in Euclidean approaches. And possibly the younger people here might ask, why the hell did you do Euclidean quantum gravity if we know that the world is uh, Lorentzian? And so um, let me first define what do I mean with Euclidean quantum gravity. Well, kind of the standard um, definition is that you, for instance, take the path integral you do some over Euclidean geometries, um, so geometries with Euclidean signature, but you also sum that not with a really quantum mechanical weight, but with a statistical weight, with the exponential minus the Euclidean action. And you have to compare that with, say, the Lorentzian path integral, where you do some over Lorentzian geometries with a weight which is um, really the quantum mechanical weight. And why have Euclidean approaches played such an important role? Well, first, there was just a practical issue um, of being able to do computations. And so Monte Carlo simulations, in particular, if it came to non-perturbative approaches, were really the standard tool to address um, quantum field theories like QCD, were highly successful. And so the same philosophy was applied to quantum gravity. Also, this Wick rotation, which basically rotates you in principle from Lorentzian to Euclidean theories, 
has been a hugely successful tool in quantum field theory. In addition, you have thermodynamic interpretations. Now, of course, well, this Euclidean approach in case of quantum gravity comes with quite a number of drawbacks um, which do not necessarily appear in quantum field theory. So one important property of uh, Euclidean action in quantum field theory is that they are bounded from below. And this is not the case anymore at all for Euclidean quantum gravity, where it's the action is not bounded from below. And again, in particular for non-perturbative lattice simulations, um, what happens is that it tends to drive the system into regions where the action becomes maximally negative. That's when the so-called conform effector is maximized. And uh, so for instance, in Ratchet Gravity, where you um, look at, at different lengths, lengths are the variables, you get so-called dominated by spike configurations, um, where you get very spiky contributions. In uh, dynamical triangulations, which kind of glue triangles together in all kinds of ways, you get so-called branched polymers, which you see an example here, which basically dominates again this um, phase well, of weak gravity. Um, and so uh, similarly in other lattice approaches with other variables, you basically fail by dr being driven, driven into this phase where the conform effector uh, is maximized. Another disadvantage or an advantage as a disadvantage for Euclidean quantum gravity is that the configuration space of Lorentzian geometries and Euclidean geometries well, is very different. So whereas in quantum field theory, you try to define the Wick rotation as a one-to-one -one map, it's not possible at all in quantum gravity. And well, the people which advertise that most were basically Renate and, and Jan starting causal dynamical triangulations and so they combine these two disadvantages to an advantage in basically restricting to Lorentzian configurations and managing to get rid of you know, these annoying conf configurations like the branch polymers and uh, see nice um, phase diagrams where you do get interesting four-dimensional um, geometries. Another feature which you don't necessarily see for Euclidean triangulations is that you cannot rely on destructive interference which might cancel out unwanted configurations. And one such example might be explained by Sumati and Steve in the case of causal sets. So one uh, big reason why Euclidean approaches have been done are computational techniques. Uh, where Monte Carlo simulations really is a working horse for uh, in quantum field theory to do non-perturbative lattice calculations. But luckily in the last years, there were more and more um, approaches to do really Lorentzian pass integrals. It's not only important in, in quantum gravity, but it's a general subject of doing real, real, so-called real-time pass integrals um, in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory for various reasons. And um, so possibly the best known technique you can do is to deform your integration contour and uh, that works on a semi-classical level and on a numerical level. So numerically you want to deform from a highly oscillating integral to a contour where the integrand is um, decaying. And the best choice you can do are so-called left shift symbols where you replace the oscillating phase with really the decaying, maximally decaying uh, phase. So this is good for, for numerical, uh, for semi-classical approximations and explicit numerical uh, integrations. Now there's also a technique which combines these left shift symbols with Monte Carlo simulations. Here the idea is that you first use the so-called gradient flow to, to 
um, flow the system to the left shift symbols. So the gradient flow is there to identify the left shift symbols. Um, this gives you a non-oscillating phase, and then you do Monte Carlo os um, simulations. So this is a very nice idea. My impression is that this is so far at a more experimental stage because there are some three parameters you have to choose for the flow. And um, in some cases, it does work. In some cases, it does not work very well. Um, so we have to learn more in how reliable it is. It's not as much understood as Monte Carlo simulations just for Euclidean systems. Um, a quite new technique, which relies on actually very old uh, ideas, are so-called acceleration, acceleration operators for series convergence. And uh, here you can treat sums and integrals, and I will talk about it in the next slides. Uh, other techniques are tensor network renormalizations, where you um, rely on an explicit summation with some truncations. So here you can also use real space integrals. Um, so uh, basically for more complicated systems, simulations have been done up to three-dimensional systems, including gauge theories. And I know uh, like the Ising model has been done on, on, in four dimensions, but uh, it's a real challenge then to scale these things up to kind of complicated systems, such as quantum gravity in four dimensions. Also in asymptotic safety in, in the last years, there have been much more work on Lorentzian signature asymptotic safety. The issue here is not so much to solve the path integral because instead you look at flow equations, but still there is a number of questions you have to address on the Lorentzian side that includes a nice parameterization of Lorentzian fluctuations. And of course there's, well, there's quantum simulations now, machine learning, um, but here the questions so this is just in, in baby shoes, so to say. The question is, can we scale up these techniques possibly to ever treat quantum gravity? Um, so this is more to be explored. So here is the first challenge that, indeed, luckily we have a number of methods now, but we really need to find better methods and uh, be, to be able to scale them up to, to larger systems. And uh, let me present this acceleration technique for series convergence in just uh, two examples. So these are real life examples from quantum gravity. It's uh, where we wanted really to treat an, a sum which is uh, with an oscillating phase. And here you see the results of the partial summations of the partial sums up to 100,000 terms of a mini superspace example. And where you see a block, the reason is here that these are lots of, lots of, lots of points, and these are highly oscillating, so you see them piled up in this block. And uh, the oscillations, after 100,000 terms, are still much larger than the final result. So if you have to, even if you sum to a million, which I did, you still find oscillations which are larger than the end result in absolute terms. So you would have really to sum a very long time like, I don't know, 10 millions to have a decent convergence. And you don't want to do that because in the end you want to treat many of these sums. But there's an old technique which comes really from the 40s and 50s, which I guess many have forgotten now. It's actually implemented in Mathematica. And here you see a comparison so it's really a series transformation. You take this series of, which is very oscillating, you apply a nonlinear transformation. Um, the ideas are quite simple. You can check it on Wikipedia on a Shanks transform. Um, and computing this, this, this transformation takes like less than a second. But here you see the result of applying this transformation to the first 100 terms of the series. And you see immediately, well, not immediately, but after 50 terms, a nice convergence. And at 100 terms, the relative error, that is, if you look at the last five or 10 examples, 
um, it's less than 10 to the minus 11. So it's a really nicely working technique in this case. And you can also treat cases where you, for instance, compute the expectation value. Then you get something which clearly does not converge. It diverges. But if you kind of take out the oscillations, you again find a nice convergence um, with a very small value here. Uh, because it's so small, the relative error is a bit larger. And so these are really nice techniques. They're not guaranteed to work for everything, but they ve seem to work very well for actually these kind of sums where we have an oscillating uh, phase. One condition is that this, the action for these systems, if you consider a discretized system, should be at most linear in the summation variable. But this is typically the case because the action is an action. And typically, discretization appears in terms of h bar. So uh, this will be the case. And in fact, it's a spa case for and spin, spin forms in four dimensions. And so you might wonder, why is it important uh, that it's linear in the discretization variable? Here, I show you just a, a very simple example of a quadratic action. Um, And here, it's just the partial sums. You can try it yourself with Mathematica. And you see a very mysterious staircase um, behavior for these partial sums. So you will wonder well, to, what it does con to what thing does it converge? And the reason why you get these staircase behavior is because about um, an interference effect between the discretization and the oscillations. So here what happens, because it's quadratic in this discrete variable, the frequency of your oscillations are uh, growing linearly. So the frequency constantly increases. And you get so-called pseudo-subtle points. That's when you have a discretization which basically probes only, say, at the top of your oscillations. Um, you find these so-called pseudo-subtle points which you see in the discrete but not in the continuum. And this will always appear if your frequency is always is linearly increasing. And so this explains this funny staircase feature. And so for these kind of oscillating sums, well, it's very hard to find any convergence. But again, that will might not appear actually in quantum mechanical systems. Um, so we have these more techniques. Another question you might ask in Euclidean approaches, it's basically the conformal factor problem, which basically killed most of the Euclidean approaches. Does it still appear in Lorentzian quantum gravity? And so if you look at the um, deformation technique, there's well, a convergence criterion to select your um, contour automatically selects the right contour. Whereas in the Euclidean approach, one way to treat the conformal factor is to rotate it by hand to the other sign if you can actually identify the, the conformal factor. Um, you know, which you can do in, in continuum approaches perturbatively, but often not in numerical approaches. And so let's look at one example. If you do a one-loop evaluation of 3D Regic quantum gravity. This you can do by just chopping up the problem in so-called partner moves, where you integrate out just one variable, as we will see. And there are two such moves. One where we have to integrate out one edge, which goes through three tetra two tetrahedra. Actually, three tetrahedra first, and you are left with two tetrahedra. In the Euclidean uh, case, you get something which is just Gaussian. In the Lorentzian case, you get something um, which is a Gaussian with an I or a Fresnel integral. So P, these P's are positive numbers. And so you can just do these, these integrals in both cases. The other kind of move is a for one move. You have to integrate four variables, four edges here. But uh, you will find that three of these are gauge modes. So we are left with one mode. And this happens to be the conformal mode. So in the Euclidean approach, you get an inverted Gaussian. 
And so here it's where you would have to define by hand. I change the sign by hand. Um, that's not necessary in the Lorentzian approach where, uh, where you get again something with an I. It also has the opposite sign from the 3-2 move. But this integral is still well defined. Um, so you don't need to do anything to treat the conformal factor in the Lorentzian case. Similarly, um, one big issue in, in Regic gravity are spike configurations. And there's been an old discussion by Jan Ambion in France that uh, the expectation values of length operators turns out to be infinite in Euclidean quantum gravity. So actually, if you look at higher dimension Regic gravity, look at the minus Euclidean action in these spike configurations, well, you get just something with an exponential increasing amplitude, which you know, will always give you infinity if you try to integrate over it. Um, but it's finite in Lorentzian quantum gravity. And in fact, I showed you the example a few slides ago, which actually computed these expectation values and gave you something finite. So well, there have been lots of Euclidean wor uh, like work on Euclidean non-perturbative quantum gravity approaches. And the big question is, how much can we rely on the results of these approaches to see whether they, what they do say about the Lorentzian versions um, of these approaches. Another aspect, which I mentioned before, is this Lorentzian versus Euclidean configuration space. And um, again, these are insights which started with uh, causal dynamical triangulations. So if you have a Lorentzian geometries, well, you have a light cone structure. And as we know, typically, each point has exactly two light cones, a future one and a past one. And the mathematician would call that a Lorentzian geometry, uh, but usually would not call this a Lorentzian geometry. <laughs> and uh, here, what happens is that you have some points where you, for instance, have four light cones. That happens if you have so-called trouser configurations in 2D, or even zero light cones. And so here, if a, a regular light cone structure, um, so I will still call that a Lorentzian spacetime. And here you see a Euclidean spacetime, you know, where you do, you, you get a bit of idea that there's much more space for getting arbitrary Euclidean spacetimes, uh, where you wouldn't care about these so-called baby universes with these fingers, or even other topologies and holes in your manifold and so on. And so that indeed is the mechanism behind causal dynamical triangulations, which does not allow such configurations. And was a big physical insight of, of Jan and Renate, but only allows not really this boring, that looks boring, uh, but it could be that, you know, uh, there's uh, a very interesting Lorentzian geometry which everywhere has two light cones. And so it leads to a new universality class of random triangulations with an interesting continuum limit in four dimensions. So, um, well, this approach is called causal dynamical triangulations because these conditions are interpreted as causality requirements. However, if you do causal sets, then these kind of configurations are actually allowed. So that's why I call them light cone irregularities. So here, uh, causal dynamical triangulations and causal sets um, have quite different philosophies concerning these uh, configurations. Of course, in causal sets, uh, uh, causal structure is basically the most important ingredient here. Um, but uh, I will ask this question for causal sets people. Well, should you get imaginary terms in the action? And the reason I'm asking that is uh, because in Regic gravity, one does get imaginary terms in the action. And so you can ask what happens for other approaches. So, so far we have been in the realm of quite combinatorical approaches. 
in ratchet gravity, you typically fix the triangulation, but look at varying edge lengths or other geometric quantities. Um, and what happens is that, in fact, you see these kind of uh, configurations where you have an irregular light cone structure quite generically. So it hasn't been investigated yet how generic it is, but if you make simple exercises, you see that they appear quite uh, generically. Um, here I just drawn the simplest example of taking four triangles. It's a Lorentzian triangulation with only space-like edges. And you can easily tune the edge lengths such that you get four light cones or also zero light cones at this center point. Um, and how you should interpret that is that you have this configuration at the trouser or the so-called Jarmulk. Um, <coughs> and such configurations even appear in, in many superspace cosmology where uh, Seth Asante will talk more about that. Uh, the results of the path integral indicate that we should actually include these configurations in the path integral. And interestingly, uh, these configurations come with an interesting complex structure. Um, so we can consider the ratchet action now as a function of the length variables and we complexify the length variables. Um, if you do that, you see that the ratchet action comes with branch cuts for these kind of configurations. And along these branch cuts, well, you have imaginary contributions. Also, you can just consider a Lorentzian configuration. Um, but these imaginary contributions come with opposite signs. So here is an example where you, know, you manage, you, you choose a time-like variable among your edge lengths and you complexify that so that's a complex plane. What you will nicely find if you consider this concept of a complex ratchet action is that it reproduces Lorentzian action um, along the real axis with both choices of overall sign and the Euclidean action again with both choices of overall sign. So that's very similar to the Wick rotation. But you have also a branch cut along a part of the real axis where you have these light cone um, irregularities. And because these come with opposite sign, you have basically a side where you enhance such kind of configurations and a side where you suppress these kind of configurations. So in fact, then you have to consider the question, which side of the branch cut should I choose? And if you choose a suppressing sign, well, that gives you a mechanism to suppress such configurations without forbidding them explicitly. So forbidding them explicitly would be quite involved because these are kind of non-local conditions. And it's a possibility to reconcile, reconcile the findings of causal dynamical triangulations and the philosophy of causal set to include such configurations, but to have also a mechanism which suppresses these. Okay, okay, we'll come back to this question of sign. So uh, you might wonder, okay, this is ratchet gravity. I'm doing continuum. Why should I care about these weird things? And so the question, does, does it appear in the continuum? Um, and is it relevant for something? And so the answer is, well, again, these complex structures have been indeed discussed in the continuum already a while ago, and uh, possibly the first paper doing that is in the context of this topology change by uh, Yorma Luku and Raphael Sorkin. And recently, this has been kind of an inspiration for an article by Witten, which indeed said, uh, well, if you have to complexify, what kind of complex matrix should, should I really choose? Um, <coughs> and which should I include in the path integral. Also, there have been a few works where it has been noticed that the, actually the gravitational action is possibly indeed complex and has imaginary terms. Um, and concerning the um, gravitational thermodynamics, 
there's basically a, a, a paper by Don Marolf, really the title is Gravitational Thermodynamics from Lorentz in Path Integrals. And uh, his aim is really to derive thermodynamic entropies from the Lorentz in Path Integrals. And he argues that in order to do that, you have to introduce co-dimension two singularities. And the interesting thing in Ratchet Gravity, these appear naturally. You don't have to introduce them by hand. And the reason why you want to introduce these singularities is exactly to allow for these kind of light cone irregularities in your path integrals. And they also appear in recent discussions for replica copies and the solution of black hole information par paradox. So it seems that these are really relevant configurations. And in fact, if you want to get to uh, entropies, you might have to choose actually the opposite sign to get these entropic contributions um, for the branch cut. So, well, overall, these are quite new developments with a few exceptions. And so there's certainly space to understand better the role of complex matrix and complex actions for the Lorentzian gravitational path integral. You know, it's very interesting whether you can accommodate them in the canonical formalism. Um, and in general, well, there's a question, should we include configurations describing topology change? And what happens, for instance, in the complex actions if you consider the sum over topologies? Um, again, sum over topologies for a long time was done in the Euclidean approach where you don't even see these complex terms. Okay, so to summarize, well, we do have now more techniques for Lorentzian quantum gravity, and that's very nice because in the end we want to do Lorentzian uh, quantum gravity. If you do Euclidean quantum gravity, you can't really answer questions about causality and all the interesting things, but we also need more techniques for doing Lorentzian quantum gravity in particular um, for having many variables to deal with in the path integral. And the main reason is that the Lorentzian configurations come with additional structure um, of having causal and light construction. And these can be often irregular, and we have to decide what to do with these configurations. Interestingly, they come with branch cut for the action and imaginary terms. Um, so here's an interesting open question. Uh, which side of the branch cut we should choose. And uh, these configurations, but also the Lorentzian pass integral actually allow for thermodynamic interpretation. So I do think that there will be lots of developments in, in this direction. Um, and uh, I will come to basically the, well, that will be the next topic. Um, and that's a question of what is the structure of quantum space-time, apart from being Lorentzian. Um, <coughs> and that starts with the topic of observables. So Klaus will give a focus talk on, on this question, so I won't talk too much about um, these issues, but I, it's something you can start with and uh, derive interesting consequences from quite simple considerations which start from observables. Um, and the main issue here is well, in quantum field theory, well, we work a lot with fields, as the name suggests. These fields are evaluated at space-time points. And the main objects are, you could argue, are endpoint functions, which indeed allow to reconstruct the full theory and the full dynamics of your quantum field theory. Well, in quantum gravity, um, you want to implement the phimorphism symmetry and invariance. And so these fields are not observables at all. So also you don't have any endpoint functions. So here is the main idea, which is really quite old and goes back to Einstein, um, is to use relational observables. So that's to take us, what is, a for instance, the field evaluated at a point where, in four dimensions, four other fields take certain values. And I guess we have quite a number of talks 
about relational observables. Um, <coughs> and so in principle, this idea is, you know, you can implement it, it works in various approaches. You can do it covariant or canonical or canonical covariant uh, in all versions. But actually the issue is that, well, if you take some um, phase-based functions here or some fields, these fields, well, they will, if you take realistic fields and relativistic fields, they will not really serve as perfect clocks. So you, it's really hard to construct something which always goes forward um, and is monotonistically increasing. So, um, you know, if you do not take artificial matter, for instance, dust, it seems there's no, not really any perfect clocks in a closed universe. And uh, there have been, by now, quite a number of literature exploring the consequences of this fact. Uh, I will explain one consequence regarding locality and uh, the power of resolving, basically, measurements. Um, there's uh, questions about what happens if you have only chaotic behavior, and so, in particular, no monotonically increasing functions which, uh, you know, the investigations which have been done by uh, Martin Boyewald, Philip Hillen, and others, and um, also questions about, well, what happens if your universe starts and ends? By definition, well, there's no field left which you can uh, use as a clock, and so it comes also with the question of unitarity, and you can go by two talks by Stephen Gielen, and then in the I guess. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> let me come basically to this question of uh, how much can you resolve quantum measurements to that end you can look at commutators and how much measurements influence each other and basically even in classical field theory using just this idea of relational clocks you could in investigate the commutator so it's a straightforward computation if you apply enough uh, approximation and you find quite theory independently, the usual result, that is the Green's function or the commutator function, which you usually get in your field theory evaluated at these points, which you define by your clock fields, but you get an extra term, which looks a bit complicated, but essentially is one plus uh, the energy of the field you want to observe, defined by the energy of your clock fields. And so if you want to make it small, it's very intuitive, that you have to increase your block, the energy of your clock fields because you can only observe, observe as sharply as fast your clock is. If you have a slow clock, well, that gives you very low resolution. So in principle, well, you want to increase your clock fields and also you want to fill the portion of space with your clock fields which you want to observe. And so these two conditions give you a bound, and that has been um, investigated first by, by Steve Giddings, Don Maroth, and uh, Jim Hartle, and the covariant approach, um, where basically they derive a locality bound because the argument is if you increase this energy too much, what you eventually will form is a black hole, and that restricts your ability to have a high resolution. And so what I like with this argument is, is very basic calculations and very basic ingredients. Um, and you can look even at much simpler systems, like the arrival of time operator. Again, the arrival of time operator is very similar to using a relativistic clock because you use as clock basically your particle position and that's quadratic in the momenta. And that happens with all kinds of relativistic clocks. And if you write down your arrival of time operator, technically there's this technical point um, which is that it's not, you cannot make itself a joint. And so you think it's a very technical point, but in fact there's huge literature on the time of arrival operator and its physical consequences. And so one paper is on deriving a new kind of uncertainty principle. Again, it's a bound on resolution which basically says the resolution you can get with or the uncertainty in your time measurement 
is bounded not by involving the uncertainty of another operator, but just involving the energy of the energy of your particle. Um, <clears throat> and so there has been a very careful uh, discussion by Haranov, Anru, and a bunch of other people. And basically the same arguments holds if you use these relativistic clocks. Uh, if you don't like these kind of canonical or covariant commutator calculations, other um, people have just looked at, at scattering for uh, ultra Planck scales. And here the argument is if you really go to very high energies, what will eventually happen again is you form black holes. And these black holes will they evap evaporate eventually via Hawking radiation and hide the process of um, ultraviolet uh, high energy scattering. In fact, uh, what you get is rather uh, soft lots of soft gravitons doing your momentum exchange. So it's also kind of UV infrared mixing. And so you have a similar mechanism that the forming of black holes hides really ultra high energy scattering and the resolution of these uh, processes. Um, so there's a general challenge which is to better understand the, ty the, the type and algebra really of observables and the properties um, of observables given that we have relativistic clocks and the possibility to find kind of new fundamental uncertainty principles. And so these are um, partially quite old considerations. Eventually they come really that we are very much used to quantum field theory where space times mostly acts as an index set, but this index set becomes quantum. And we have to deal with it. Um, and so we can ask what is then the resulting structure of quantum space time. And so a number of approaches have kind of started with this question and made proposals um, to either replace basically classical space times more or less directly with um, either fractal space times or fractal dimensions. Non commutative space time really starts from these heuristic arguments of not being able to resolve uh, measurements in two independent directions. Um, well, loop quantum gravity and spin forms. There, what you find is that geometric op you have geometric operators, which also in some sense give you finite resolution because they come with finite spectra and so on. Other approaches are a bit more radical and basically are based on the idea that eventually you have to um, reconstruct space time from some underlying features. And depending on your viewpoint, there's basically this list of approaches which includes holography, local holography, matrix and tensor models, group field theories, strings. Um, you can have also area matrix, which are different from length matrix, twist of space, uh, relative locality, and bond duality. These all start with the idea that what you should start with is uh, not space time, but possibly the observation of momenta and momenta exchange. And so, what would be nice is actually a better um, connection between observable algebras and properties and their symmetries and the structure of quantum space time, which you postulate in order to um, compare this on the level of, of, of observable algebras. Um, let me come to the, to the next challenge and that's reconstructing our universe. And so, uh, typically, you know, you start with very, very radical ideas on a very fundamental level. So here I take something, you know, for some reasons, causal sets, and I have to reproduce our universe with, you know, all the examples of galaxy formation, you know, the Big Bang, our Earth somewhere. So and the challenge is, of course, that you have to bridge an enormous number of scales, which is unprecedented uh, in, in physics. And you can understand the problem of quantum gravity 
as a problem of defining really consistent theory, which is valid on all scales. Um, here, this idea of bridging these scales, for instance, using the renormalization group, is one starting point to develop a common language for uh, quantum gravity approaches and the emergence of space time. And so, if you would be really able to do that in, in a more straightforward way, that will also allow us to derive quantum gravity signatures. But there is this uh, sentiment, basically, that so far we have not seen any signatures of quantum gravity. In fact, you might deduce that from a title by Giovanni Amelino Camellia, you know, which uh, is basically, are we now really at the dawn of quantum of gravity phenomenology? So possibly we are. Um, <coughs> I mean, it's very hopeful that we find more and more measurements where this is the case with multi messengers, astronomy, gravitational wave, um, and now nanograph, and so on. But since we will have an entire session on, this, on the, all these new exciting measurements, I will not comment too much on that. Um, but comment more on the many features that our universe ha has already, which we know about, which uh, ask for an explanation. And so that depends on how radical is you want to be in order to explain certain features. And that includes fake quantum theory, if you don't put it in, <laughs> in your approach, you might want to get it out. It's the fact that at least on macroscopic scale, we have a four-dimensional smooth space-time, uh, Lorentzian signatures, but also gravitational dynamics, um, small and positive cosmological constant. Do you need some extra field for inflation, or does your quantum gravity theory provide a mechanism for uh, inflation or explaining uh, standard cosmology? The fact that uh, well, we seem to need initial conditions, but they are also quite simple. Can you explain matter from your theory? And the kind of matter. Can you explain dark matter? And the types of matter and values of the matter couplings. And uh, of course, some of you might say, ah, oh, I've solved that already. That's great. Um, and we can discuss. But in general, I guess there's no, not really one approach which have, has solved all these things. Um, so happy reconstructing and deconstructing <laughs> in the rest of the... So thank you, Bianca, for this very nice talk. Um, I'm leaving time for questions. So. Uh, is there anything the audience still wants to know? Yes, please. Just wait for the microphone to arrive and then everybody will be able to hear your question. Well, perhaps a bit crazy question. So if uh, in, from some statement of your talk, I had an impression that perhaps we can say that the black holes can be treated as a co consequence of observation procedure. Is it true that is, uh, when we observe, we should apply additional energy? It implies an impossibility of large energy, and this creates black holes. So, can we see that the black uh, can we see that the black holes is an uh, observation artifact? I think the argument relies that, that, uh, on, on, the, on the fact that if you want to resolve space-time processes at very, very small distances, yeah, yeah. You, you, need, well, you need always high energy. Yeah. And so, uh, in particular, if you want to resolve these very small processes also on a larger space-time region, where you need to concentrate high energies in a given area, yeah. and you can only do that up to a certain point, after which you do form a black hole. So that's just a theoretical fact. 
which relies that, uh, on, 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 on theorems that say you do form generically black, hole, black holes if that happens. Uh, we have also, people have been speculating that that might happen in the Large Hadron Collider. That has not happened yet. If that, uh, but there have been these calculations, for instance, at some point in case uh, quantum gravity scale scales down. Um, yeah, but this is, this is a general idea. And so the arguments are very similar to old arguments which have been done about the Heisenberg uncertainty principles which are basically also very similar that if you want to observe something, you need a photon, and that needs a certain energy. And if that arrives at your particle, it will disturb the particle. Uh, so here it's really, however, new that this black hole formation comes really from the property of having a gravitational system. Yes, there's a second question from the audience. Yeah, uh, I, I would just, I, I didn't want to ask a second question. I would just like to... Uh, continue on, on this black hole thing. The, the, the argument uh, that uh, the black hole forms when, when, you, when you put large amount of matter into a small enough amount of volume um, uh, rests on the assumption that general relativity is assumed to hold at those scales. But typically we do not know that, right? So we, 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 we assume that there will be quantum corrections to GR, to Einstein's equations. So we really don't know if a black hole will form or not on those scales. So it might happen that uh, we get quantum contributions or quantum corrections to, to Einstein's equations so that the black hole does not form at those scales, so that you can uh, look at smaller distances without uh, having this limit. So yeah, it's, I guess. A, it's a loophole to, to this argument, basically. Um, yes, it depends also on, on how much a region you want to resolve, basically, um, because I guess at some point you do say that, um, well, you assume that gravity holds for larger regions, um, and then you do expect that these black hole theorems still apply and form a horizon. So I guess you have to be, you have to dif differentiate between having a horizon and possibly having really black hole similarities. So as as soon as you still have a horizon, uh, you might still see these effects. So it depends on whether your modification is strong enough to resolve horizon formation. Which, you know, I, I typically think that most theories still allow for horizon. Okay, Alicia, <laughs> then it's your question. Uh, so Deepan Betal, he's asking, uh, when considering quantum matter fields in quantum gravity backgrounds, will there be any changes in the renormalization of the matter theory due to the uh, UV and IR mixing? Will there be any changes? On the renormalization. Well, there will be changes, yes, the matter. because already at a very basic level, you will always... Uh, get, for instance, graviton, graviton loops, so that will still contribute, and Frank <laughs> is an expert in that. Uh, and the, I mean, um, uh, and indeed, there is some, when I say coupling constants, that is from consider, considering, um, considering the interaction between, between matter and, and gravity, and it's Astrid Eichhorn, which push, push, pushed it quite a lot to um, get predictions from quantum gravity for uh, coupling, coupling constants of matter by considering the question or by postulating that uh, quantum gravity should be still asymptotically safe. So do you get UV infrared mixing? Um, well, the system I was describing, or these examples, do involve, involve matter. So... Uh, this idea comes from scattering um, matter particles, and the question is indeed, if you go to high enough energies, do they form black holes? And the idea is that black holes, uh, in the end, uh, are more infrared phenomena. So in that case, you get UV infrared mixing. There's one more question by Renate Loll. Yes, hi. Um, well, thanks for a beautiful overview talk, and thanks for 
highlighting the larger perspectives, right, and the, 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 the common issues. So uh, for the Lorenzian story, which I think, of course, yeah, is close to my heart, so you presented a number of, you know, new ideas. Um, now, as we've also learned, you know, from something like looking at uh, non-perturbative lattice approaches, uh, well, there is, a, of course, at the end of the line, you want to do these things not just for perturbative systems and for, you know, quantum cosmological systems, but for the whole non-perturbative story and the full quantum field theory. And then, of course, you know, if you look at something like CDT, of course we can introduce these more irregular configurations, but then the question is, can you in the end actually do the sum and does the sum make any sense whatsoever? So, which of these approaches is, you know, you, you listed there of the new ideas is the most promising in that regard, you would say? Um, oh, you mean the, the calculational techniques? Yeah, yeah, you had a whole number of bunch, you know, new ideas, maybe not some not so new ideas. Uh, okay. Going Lorentzian. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so most of the, I mean, some of the calculational techniques have been only explored indeed for systems with, with few variables. And, uh, uh, but the works are quite recent, so I hope one can push them. Uh, to higher dimensions, and hopefully, possibly, it might be some combination of tensor network techniques or ideas which come from tensor networks, which is finding reasonable truncations. So, uh, in some sense, tensor networks sounds a bit uh, scary, but the idea is really to find uh, best truncations for your renormalization flow. So, best truncations uh, where you only throw away irrelevant terms. And for, for instance, these uh, summation techniques. Um, but mostly it is an open question. So uh, where we have to develop techniques which, are, uh, which, which can hold for systems with more variables. So one thing which is explored in QCD uh, are, well, are these holomorphic gradient flow. Um, systems, uh, but uh, my, my understanding is that it's more subtle than standard Monte Carlo Euclidean simulations. Um, and then you can always hope on quantum simulations, <laughs> I guess, uh, and machine learning, but unfortunately what I've seen so far uh, are simulations where which might see quantum gravity, but they involve like angular momentum systems of one or two few spins, so we have to be hopeful or indeed tackle on the other hand uh, the other questions. How much can Monte Carlo simulations <coughs> tell us about uh, simulating the full Lorentzian pass integrals? I think we had, ah, there was one more question from here. If you can make it brief. No, no. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. So since we're talking about fundamental issues, one of the problems that usually is kind of put under the rug, as in on par with problem of time, is the problem of collapse of the wave function. And uh, so I, I personally like the version with the, the coherence. Well, the whole universe is already in the superposition, but locally it looks like it's not. Yeah, I hope Klaus would talk more about that. So okay. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the coherence with Klaus. Okay, so then okay. I'll wait for that. Then let's move the question to the next talk. Start.